Hello, uh, I am Matt Germer, a fellow at the R Street Institute, and I will be moderating our event today on loser's consent. Thank you for joining us. Uh, a few quick notes before we get started uh, as housekeeping items. I I'd like to note uh, for the folks who are joining us on Zoom, we do not have chat available as a feature today and no one will be monitoring that. Uh, however, please feel encouraged to send any questions you have to us through the Q&A feature on Zoom, or you can send us an email at events at rstreet.org. If you have any questions, we're going to try to get to those questions as time permits. Um, we do have a few guests joining us today, and so our time will be limited. And my apologies in advance uh, if your question is not answered. That being said, uh, we are also recording this event, uh, and so it will be available to share with others in the coming days. And so if you uh, had a question or, or wanted to, to clarify something that was said, um, I'd like to encourage you to find the recording and, and share it with your colleagues or take a listen back again uh, to hear uh, the discussion once more. Um, finally, I'd like to point out that our discussion today uh, is based on a recent paper that we released over at rstreet.org. Uh, it's called Restoring Loser's Consent, A Necessary Step to Stabilizing Our Democracy. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, I'd encourage you to do so, um, maybe after the event ends. But if you're someone who can do two things at once, uh, perhaps a second window can be open as you scroll through it. So with that said, I'd like to welcome everyone formally to our event today entitled Loser's Consent, How Do We Stabilize Our Democracy? I'm Matthew Germer. I'm a fellow at the Governance Program at R Street Institute. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with our work at R Street, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization. Uh, that's what many folks might just call a think tank. Um, we have a mission to engage in policy research and outreach to promote free markets and limited effective government. Uh, we believe free markets work better than the alternatives, and we also recognize that the legislative process calls for practical responses to current problems. And that's why we hold our motto, uh, free markets, real solutions. I serve as a fellow within the governance program at R Street, where I focus on elections, both how to make our elections more accessible and secure, but also looking at big picture reforms to help rethink how our electoral system can incentivize good behavior from our elected officials. Today, we will be discussing the topic of loser's consent over the course of two panels. For those unfamiliar with our work at R Street on this topic, and you can find our policy paper on our website, rstreet.org, the topic can be summarized like this. Democracy relies upon the consent of the losers. Following an election, members of the losing side are the ones with an incentive to rebel against the winning side. To keep a stable democracy, it's imperative that the losers must value the institution of the government more than they value the control of the government. They must be willing to accept the results and try again at the next election. I'd like to note that with discussions about electoral politics, we all bring in our own biases and experience which is to say that we might perceive ourselves to be the winners or the losers in this present moment. But if you've followed politics for any amount of time, you're bound to have experienced both victory and defeat as a member of a political coalition. And if you wait long enough, you'll experience both sides over and over again. And that's why it's important that we have a stable system in place to encourage the losing side to consent to the authority of the winning side. And this isn't just limited to candidates who have to concede an election. It includes all of us as voters and particularly voters from the entire losing coalition who recognize the authority of the victors. So with that being said, here's what we'll look forward to over the next hour. First, we'll talk to political scientists, Sean Bowler, and if scheduling stars align, which I think they will, we'll also be able to talk to Todd Donovan, each co-authors of the 2007 book, Losers Consent, Elections and Democratic Legitimacy. We'll talk a bit about some high level questions on losers consent, why it's important and where we stand today. We'll follow that up with a discussion featuring a panel that brings together some on the ground experience with campaigns alongside some of the brightest minds in electoral reform. And we'll hear a little bit more about how losers consent functions on the ground and what can be done to make it easier for those who lose elections in the future to play again. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce our first panel. Uh, we have with us at the moment, um, Sean Bowler. He is the Dean of the Graduate Division at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, he is a distinguished professor and the Dean of the Graduate Division at the University and has served as a member of the board of the American National Election Studies, as a member of the editorial board of both Ethical Studies and Journal of Politics, and as president of the Western Political, Scientist, or Political Science Association. He has focused his studies on the relationship between voters and institutions and representative democracy 
and has previously co-authored a number of books and articles on this subject, including The Future is Ours, Minority Politics, Political Behavior, and the Multiracial Era of American Politics, The Limits of Electoral Reform, and Reforming the Republic. Sean, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Hello. So I'd like to start today by asking uh, a bit about uh, what inspired you to write the book uh, on Losers Consent 2007? And at the same time, if you can touch on defining what, it, what do we mean when we use a phrase like loser's consent, or what did you mean as you use that phrase? Yeah, I mean, first I should acknowledge it is a collaborative project. There are a number of other authors on it. It's an international group. There was um, Chris Anderson, Andre Blay from Montreal, who I list out from Norway. And it's a common concern across electoral democracy. While a lot of the attention is on the winners, any election time, just like there is in any contest you see, the Oscars or, or the Emmys or some of the sort of award show, the response of the losers turns out to be quite important in deciding whether or not the process continues for another cycle or not, because you need to people to accept the idea that they've lost the election. And so in this was an attempt to look at something comparatively across that's common across electoral democracies and something that wasn't studied so much as perhaps we thought it should be. Great, and so I'd like to ask, you know, with, with that in mind, um, why is this important? And in, in particular, um, it, does this seem important to you now that we put a focus on loser's consent in our current time? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, I mean the obvious immediate example are responses to the 2020 election loss for Donald Trump. And we can see that in a number of ways in which the people who lost are, are, are not quite ready to accept that. And as a consequence of that, we see a number of different behaviours going on. So, for example, a whole series of lawsuits. We also see a whole series, a whole set of public opinion data, which shows how angry people are, how unwilling they are to accept the result, and how willing they are to act on that anger. Uh, in some cases, we saw that in January sixth that there were a lot of people very angry about the misperception of electoral loss that was that tied into that. And so, what we see currently in our politics is a whole bunch of activity that is a consequence of people not consenting to the loss. Uh, one of the things I should say about the academic literature is um, one of the limitations of the study is that we weren't that good, and I think we're moving into it now, to look at more and more of what those consequences are, and uh, how deleterious they could be. So I want to ask about that because you, you mentioned um, areas of research hasn't covered. Um, it seems in my impression of the book, uh, you know, it's, it's almost 15 years old at this point uh, and was written in a time period in which um, Vice President Al Gore lost uh, a contentious election, went to the Supreme Court and followed up the Supreme Court's decision with a concession speech that effectively said, I don't like the decision that was made, but I'm willing to accept it. I'm going to encourage folks to accept it for the stability of our country. Uh, and that, as I read through the book, seemed to take the United States' ability to handle loss for granted, uh, and that things might have changed in that time period. I, I'll point out that in the paper that, that we have available on rstreet.org, um, that I noted that there has been a bit of a vicious cycle that has happened, that it's not, if you look at an event like uh, January 6th, it's not an isolated incident, that it took a series of um, steps along the way to get there. And, you know, not to necessarily draw equivalencies, but that we've had conversations over whether or not presidential candidates will accept the outcome of the election um, for four or five years uh, in advance of the 2020 election, whether that was Donald Trump himself as a candidate, uh, Hillary Clinton even following the election, making uh, claims that the Russians were responsible and that perhaps Trump's uh, election wasn't legitimate. Uh, in the 2018 midterm, um, we saw a, a, a gubernatorial candidate uh, refused to concede, and, and I believe still refused to concede to this day. It's Stacey Abrams in Georgia. Uh, much of this, in, in, my, in my argument, it kind of paved the way for continued withholding of consent. And I'm wondering um, if you see it similarly, is this a vicious cycle problem? Uh, is it a series of steps? And should we no longer be taking this subject for granted in the United States? Wow, there's a lot there. I think to talk about. So I may, I may talk, so if I talk too long, just say, just make some gesture or something. I think there's uh, a couple of things to say. One is 
yeah, it really is unusual to see this happen in the US in this sort of way. We're not used to it. And for generations of political scientists, we're brought up on the idea that the US is a model democracy, a model for the rest of the world. So in the, uh, in the wave of democratization, for example, that uh, came after the fall of the Berlin Wall, America was the example, American constitutional practice was the example. And that turned out not to be the case, that we, we were too confident in that. And one of the things that's happened is, I think you're quite right, is that this isn't all Donald Trump, and it isn't only Donald Trump. And while it may mostly be the GOP, it's not solely the GOP as well. There is this long history of polarization over the past generation that provides a background to this unwillingness to accept a loss to the other side, because the other side is so bad. If you're a Democrat, the Republicans are so bad, if you're probably the Democrats are terrible. And what we've seen is, uh, as you said, a whole series of examples for a long period of time that have prepped people to expect that there is something wrong with our election. So, for example, one of the consequences, one of the fallouts of this, the election is rotten, is, a, is yet another interest in electoral reform. And there was a big one after 2000, electoral reform in the sense of reforming electoral administration. Mm -hmm. Except that that claim has been about uh, there's something wrong with elections has been going on at states now for 20 years, pretty much. Uh, and you can see uh, the, in the state level laws, repeated examples of claims being made that the elections are fraudulent, the elections are rigged. And so we have to do something about it, which means that the current situation is, you're, you're quite right, I quite agree with you, is does reflect something longer term that's happened over a long period of time and uh, accompanies and feeds this growing polarization. And I'll stop there. And, and I'll note too that we've had, we have Todd Donovan joining us now as well. Hi, Todd, thank you. Um, to give folks a brief introduction as to who he is, Todd Donovan is a professor of political science at Western Washington University, uh, where he conducts research on elections and opinion in Washington state, the United States, and occasionally in Australia, Canada, and Great Britain. Uh, he is the co-author of a number of books as well, uh, often alongside our guest, Sean Bowler, including Electoral Reform and Minority Representation, Local Experiments with Alternative Elections, The Limits of Electoral Reform, and Reforming the Republic. Uh, Professor Donovan is also himself an elected official and serves on the Whatcom County Council in Washington. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'd like to give you a chance to, um, I guess I'll catch you up very briefly to mention that uh, we were able to define loser's consent and reflect uh, quickly on the book back from 2007. But I'm wondering, uh, in your perspective, with all that's happened in the intervening 14, 15 years since the time that that book released, uh, it's, it was my view on reading, on reading the book that loser's consent was taken for granted in the United States at the time that that was written. Um, do you agree with that characterization? And if, if so, or either way, do you think that it should be taken for granted now? I don't know if I'd say it was, and, and thanks for having me, I'm sorry, I was a bit late. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say it was taken for granted. I think um, the, the book has a heavily comparative European focus in part because a lot of the data that we were working with was available, it was more available in Europe, the survey work that we were doing. Um, so I don't, I, it, the American stuff kind of didn't quite fit in with that. Um, but no, I, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think it was taken for granted. Um, but I, I think, you know, kind of looking back on, on the book, um, if we were doing it again, um, we, we kind of measured some things that were fairly soft in terms of, you know, trust in government satisfaction with democracy and how, you know, how losers um, have different attitudes on those sorts of things. Um, I, I think what's maybe different now is um, the, the sort of concern about democratic deconsolidation or, um, you know, illiberal attitudes um, among people. Um, that's not something that um, I think we, we were able to get into enough. So if, if, if we were doing it again, I think that would be, that'd be an area where, where we'd, we'd probably want to look at. And, 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 I, and I, you know, following off with what Sean said um, about the, the concerns about electoral fraud, um, yeah, that, that goes back, um, you, know, you can remember that in, in 2000, it was Democrats thinking the election system was wrong. In 2004, it was Democrats thinking that, um, the uh, uh, the Ohio machine voting things were rigged. Um, Republicans thinking that illegal voters were were um, casting ballots. Um, all that stuff was going on before we we even wrote the book. So that the, the sense about um, the mechanics of elections and 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 cynicism about the mechanics of elections. 
I think that's as much as that predated what, when we started doing that, that's something else that, that is, that is, I think that's changed kind of structurally. Um, so not that we're going to write the book again, but if we did, those would be some of the things we maybe want to look at. So then I'm curious, um, kind of looking toward the, toward the future then, if you have thoughts, uh, and, and we'll go to each of you in turn, on what can be done to help ensure losers consent going forward. Uh, my paper outlined a few different options, um, each of which I will admit uh, would have varying levels of impact and, and varying levels of lift to implement. Uh, but what, you know, what, what I looked at were ideas that can allow for more proportional representation, that if voters feel like they are having more of an impact in who represents them in government, uh, that they would, you would have less or fewer losers, as it turns out, and that the stakes of losing may not feel as dramatic. That if it's you know, a flipping from one side to the other and a feeling that uh, the direction of the policy of the country flips with it, the, state, the consequences are high. Um, and that can really add to the resentment of losing. Uh, I also looked at uh, reducing partisanship in election administration, that if folks feel like even if they lost, that they got a fair shake, that could help encourage them to participate in the future. Uh, I point out that there's really, I think, an opportunity to combat misinformation and myths about the election. Um, and whether that's things like, you know, allegations that don't have any evidence to back them up, um, or things that, that everyone just, in my view, at this point kind of takes for granted, like uh, that there is a, uh, an impact, a partisan impact on turnout. And so you'll see um, uh, uh, elected officials promoting one reform or another with the intent to boost or hold back turnout, thinking it'll have a partisan impact. And, and everyone seems to have just bought into this. Um, and then the last thing I looked at is a little bit more of a softer factor, um, which is, you know, I think it's important for voters to demand more virtue from candidates. Uh, that candidates themselves need to show humility in defeat, and that they need to show graciousness in victory. I think there is a, 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 a sore winners beget sore losers problem that can happen as well. Um, that, you know, even if a voter isn't individually able to, to create a proportional representation system, uh, they are responsible for, you know, the kind of character traits that they, that they want out of their candidates. And so those were the things I put forward as potential solutions. I'm wondering, you know, feel free to reflect on those ideas or if you have anything else to bring forward. And we can start, since we started with Sean, we'll start with Todd this time. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, no, one of your um, recommendations was like a top five, top four, top five ranked choice voting system. And it, 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 one of the books that Sean and I did is called The Limits of Reform. You know, we, we always get to these big expectations about how reforms are gonna um, make people better engaged or, or, or fix some ills in the, in the political system. And there's a lot of uncertainty about all these things. And oftentimes, you know, they don't, they don't deliver in ways that the proponents uh, sort of sold them as. But, but I, I think there's a lot of promise with, with, with ranked choice voting, not, not just in terms of how the voters might change their perceptions, but in terms of how campaigns are conducted. Um, it, it, not that they'd be less partisan or less polarizing or whatever, but the, the fact that people have to make appeals to their rivals, you know, supporters, give me your second choice or your third choice or something. Uh, I think there's a, there's a little bit of evidence, um, at least one paper I did, that, that people perceive less negativity in, in, in campaigns in, in, in the ranked choice voting context. Um, so I think that I, there's, there's maybe some promise there. I and mean, all these things, you know, if, even they just did a little, um, could help from where we are. The, the um, nonpartisan election administration, um, I, you know, I, that, I thought a lot about that. Like, in, should election sectors of state be elected or should they be appointed? Um, and if they're elected, should they run as nonpartisan? Um, or can you, you know, get ways like our, the Secretary of State of Washington is now being vetted for a top post in the Department of Homeland Security for election administration. And she's a Republican being appointed by the Biden administration. So that's sort of maybe not nonpartisan, but cross-partisan um, efforts in election administration really help. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, talk about sore winners or, or um, you know, candidates needing virtue. It's, it's it, it, the signals that um, people in office send are, are probably the most important thing in terms of uh, how people perceive the legitimacy of elections and the, and the legitimacy of how elections are conducted. Um, so, you know, whether you're talking about the Secretary of State of Georgia, the Secretary of State of, of, of Washington, that they, you know, whatever their party is, they have to be, you know, in a position of um, 
transparency and, and, and something that at least people perceive as being nonpartisan in the message that they say, and not just sectors of state, but, but elect officials generally. So that, that's the hardest, you know, how, how do you get that virtue that you're talking about in, instilled in candidates? We, we can think of all these kind of mechanical and procedural reforms that'll maybe soften um, some of the perceptions about elections being um, less than legitimate. But at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, what are the winners and losers saying to their supporters? Right, right, Sean? Yeah, I, I'm gonna um, yeah, I'm gonna start with a note of blue, I suppose, which is that I, I think that one of the things that strikes me is there was just a lot of incentives for losers not to consent back then. There's a lot of money to be made by fundraising on this issue of election fraud. There's a lot of campaigns to be won among Republican primaries on the basis of election fraud. And so there are a lot of people out there that for the foreseeable future whose interest is in perpetuating this idea that there's something wrong and, and keeping stoking the fires of anger. I mean, Mike Lindell is the pillow guy, is that right? There are a bunch of election lawyers out there, pollsters, who are willing to take his money to say, yeah, we'll, we'll show this for all night. There's, there's just so much money, so many votes out there in persisting with this. And I think that's important to recognize because I think that means there's no silver bullet for this, for, for solving this. And there's a lot of different things you could take. And, you know, institutional reforms are a piece of that. I think that's right. How big of a piece, of, I don't know, and I'd say two things. One is, yeah, I think Tom's right about it. He's doing this work on uh, ranked choice voting, and I think that's quite promising. I think further the reform of the primary process to open up the that's primary process might be helpful because, um, you know, right now, uh, extremist candidates have no real threat in the primaries, so really you need to moderate the polarization that primaries help promote in some way. So opening those up and having top two systems or more open primaries might help. Um, because at the end of the day, it really does depend as said, on, and as you said, on the virtue in public office, on recognizing that. And that's something else that we've done in a general cultural thing. We have this general disregard for good people in public office and for people doing good things in public office. And that just seems hardwired into being American these days. And that's not helpful. And so we're all, we're, we're primed to believe bad things about it. So putting that together, where does, it, where does that thing? I don't think there's a silver bullet. I do think we have to be cautious about the incentives for a lot of people, but not just candidates, but polling companies, lawyers, all the kind of the group of people who hang around candidates to perpetuate this myth. Uh, and so what that means is that it probably takes action on a lot of different fronts to be able to do this one. Institutional reform is a piece of that, but again, it's not a silver bullet. I do think these ones that break down the posture, sort of break apart this idea that there's two and only two choices and it's us versus them, those are helpful, I think. So ranked choice, open primaries, proportional representation, those kinds of things will help break, break that down. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. And, and I will note here as we start to approach the bottom of the hour, if folks have questions uh, for us, they can feel encouraged to reach out uh, by email at events at rstreet.org. Uh, and for those of us who are with us on Zoom, uh, I believe our Q&A function is live. Um, so I, I do have another question. Maybe this might end up being the last one, given the amount of time that we have available to us um, and, and pending uh, audience questions. Um, you know, I don't want to spring you with, you know, recent polling data that you may not have seen, but Pew Research uh, released a report last week uh, looking at democracy internationally. It included the United States as part of its research, uh, whether or not folks felt satisfied with the way democracy is working in their country. Um, and the results were not um, optimistic for the United States. Uh, roughly 60% of Americans were not satisfied with the way democracy was working here. But at the same time, something like 85% of them um, believe that there's an opportunity for reform uh, and, and that things do need to be reformed. And so I'm curious in, in your viewpoints, um, are, the American, are, they, are the American people ready for reform? Uh, or is, are we still in a place at, you know, in our present moment where we need to be holding tight uh, and kind of waiting for the tides to turn? Um, you know, I, I, I don't expect any of us to necessarily have a crystal ball, but I'm wondering if you can give a little bit of a, a, your take on uh, whether or not the American people have an appetite for uh, the reforms necessary. And I'll start with Sean on this one. Oh, yeah, because I, I, yeah, <laughs> that, that's quick, think fast. Um, I guess I'd say uh, 
two things. I haven't, I haven't seen the report, and so I'm, I'm just sort of freewheeling here uh, as we go. I mean, I, it's not surprising that people aren't happy. I mean, we're still just coming out, maybe, of a COVID epidemic. There are all kinds of things that went wrong that tumult on last year. Uh, and especially, I think, the, um, the long legacy, I think, of, of the George Floyd murder and the similar events across the US. I mean, I think there's a lot of events there that a lot of people are processing. And there's a lot of people who are ready for some things to change, both locally in terms, for example, local policing structures and outreach, and local government in, government in that sense, which is an immediate sense of government, as well as these bigger ones about what's the government doing about the, the economy. So um, it's not surprising there's uh, a taste for reform or a taste for changing things. Um, I'm sometimes hesitant. Reform is always, a, oh, we're going to make things better as opposed to just change it. And I think there's a lot more response, you know, there's a support for changing it, whatever it is, rather than necessarily making it better. Mm -hmm. I think, though, a key thing becomes, how do you accomplish that? And that depends on electeds, elected politicians in the US having a taste for reform that benefits the system and just doesn't benefit them. And boy, there's not a lot of evidence of that, of the, but whether we look at the state houses or Washington DC, there's not a lot of evidence that our political class is ready, like political groups and, are and, and perhaps to be honest, not a lot of incentive for them to, to see things that way. Yeah, um, I, I think so. Todd, I'll give you the last word here, I think, as we, as we approach the bottom of the hour and we shift out our panels. Yeah, I haven't seen that Pew study, but they, they, they had a similar one a couple of years ago that said, you know, 60% of Americans Think that fundamental structural changes are needed in the American political system, and a majority of Republicans or near majority of Republicans and, and majority of Democrats. They also found that um, people thought democracy in America was working okay, but that there, you know, there were these structural things. Whether we're talking about campaign finance reform or districting or um, some of the reforms we've talked about here, that people do seem to support. But um, but as Sean says, like, how do you, you know, how do you get that to happen if it's you know, the people in office are the ones that are controlling changing rules and you know out west here we, some of these things get done through uh, initiatives you know if, if, if the uh, redistricting commissions in a lot of states were, were adopted either by the threat of an initiative or um, actually by an initiative what do you think about term limits that's how states got term limits um so there's um or even you know that might be the way we we finally get proportional representation uh, ranked choice voting in maine and alaska were done by the ballot initiative and then you know that's not the whole country um so i you know i think the, you know the, the the appetite is there um there's it takes advocacy groups educating the people about what some of these reforms are and then it takes kind of the opportunity of, of, of windows opening up when you can you can get that on the ballot in, in terms of places that don't have direct democracy um that's that's much harder um because then you're, you're counting on people who are winning under the current rules to change the rules so right. but, but I'm, I'm optimistic at least you know where where there's direct democracy well that's good to hear and I, I appreciate ending on a note of optimism here uh since it seems like often conversations we have around electoral uh structure and uh, politics in the united states uh can be a bit dour so thank you for the note of optimism uh, thank you both for joining us. Uh, we'll start to transition into our second panel here. You're welcome to stick around. Uh, feel free to flip your camera off uh, and, and your microphone onto mute uh, as we bring on our next panel. If you are a part of our next panel, uh, you are now welcome to turn your cameras on and flip your microphones on. Uh, I will take a moment to provide an introduction for the four of you um, and to give folks a reminder if they're joining us partway through, um, we are talking about loser's consent. Uh, the idea that it's important not just for losing candidates but also for their voters and their coalitions uh, to recognize the winners and their authority following an election which can be very difficult and there are a number of incentives against doing that uh, but largely losers uh, and there's a harsh term to call folks losers but the losing side of an election uh, needs to value the institution of government more than they value control of the government uh, and that in certain circumstances can be asking a lot uh, so looking, moving forward now to our second half of the panel, I'd like to bring on uh, Meredith Blacken. I'll, I'll introduce her first. She is a longtime public affairs strategist uh, with more than a decade of national experience in communications, marketing, political operations, and management. Uh, her work includes campaigns in more than a dozen states, among them battleground states like Arizona, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Uh, she is a speechwriter, has been a speechwriter for former U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross and later the Republican National Convention. 
Uh, Meredith now writes for business executives, political candidates, and elected officials at her firm, Foresight Messaging. Meredith, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, I will introduce next Sarah Walker, who is the executive director at Circular Democracy. Uh, Sarah is a veteran election policy specialist, and she oversees all of Secure Democracy's state and federal legislative work and partnership management. Prior to joining Secure Democracy, Sarah served in state government and held various roles in government relations. Uh, she's an expert on voting and elections legislative issues. Uh, Sarah frequently speaks to the media as a source of information and as a spokesperson for Secure Democracy. She's been quoted in the New York Times, Politico, The Hill, Business Insider, Dallas Morning News, The Houston Chronicle, The Atlanta Journal Constitution, The Tampa Bay Times, The Louisville Courier Journal, The Center for Public Integrity, The Fulcrum, and many more outlets. Uh, too many to name at the time. So, uh, Sarah, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Next, I'll introduce Jason Roberts. Jason. Uh, is a professor specializing in American political institutions with an emphasis in the US Congress. Uh, right now, he is serving as a professor of political science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in poli sci from the University of North Alabama, his master's in poli sci from Purdue, and his PhD from the Washington University in St. Louis. Prior to joining the faculty at UNC, Professor Roberts was an assistant professor of political science and law at the University of Minnesota. His research interests include parties and procedures in the US Congress and congressional elections. And he's currently working on a project that explores the role of ballot type on the competitiveness of congressional elections in the United States. Jason, thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Finally, our fourth panelist I'll introduce is Arthur Davis. Arthur is a former United States representative for Alabama's seventh congressional district where he served from 2003 to 2011. Uh, while he was successful in multiple campaigns for Congress, he also provides a perspective today as, as someone who has participated in hard fought elections for governor of Alabama and mayor of the city of Montgomery. I'm sure he's not uh, necessarily uh, the most fond about those memories, but they are a valuable experience, I think, in the context of our uh, conversation today. Uh, prior to his political career, Arthur sir, uh, earned his bachelor's degree and Juris Doctor from Harvard, uh, where he graduated with uh, magna cum laude and cum laude, respectively. Uh, he also served as the assistant U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Alabama. Following his career as an elected official, uh, he returned to the practice of law and works in the field of workplace discrimination. Arthur, thank you for joining us. Matt, thanks for having me. I'd like to start with you, if I can, uh, with a question. As you are the panelist we have here today who has on the ground experience, both as a successful candidate and in some hard fought campaigns that didn't turn out the way you wanted them to. Uh, I'm wondering if you can speak to us about what it's like you know, maybe picking a scab here, but what it's like accepting defeat as a candidate, but yet still being willing to try again in the future. You know, two observations, Matt, a great politician a long time ago once said, if you lose an election, you'll get over the fact you lost. Other people never will. Uh, that's, and I think most of us who've been through that experience would say that's dead on. Um, what I have learned as a candidate over time is that two sets of forces I think would work, and I'll quickly talk about them, that are perhaps different from when I first started thinking about running for office in the late 1990s. First of all, we live in a culture today that across ideological lines, across any sort of partisan lines, across generational lines, there's a perspective that winners win and losers lose. And that perspective, which a Donald Trump fed into, but candidly folks on the left feed into as well, has changed the nature of election outcomes. So someone who loses an election today is enduring that experience in the midst of a cultural identification of losing with weakness, of losing with a lack of ability, of an equation of losing with a lack of performance skills, and an equation of winning with skill, fortitude, determination. So when you hear sayings like refuse to lose or losing is not an option, that mindset is where those phrases come from. It's a theory that if you have the will, if you have the determination, you will be successful. Well, people from Abraham Lincoln to Bill Clinton to George W. Bush to Barack Obama to Ronald Reagan can tell you that's not so. And I've just named a pretty talented group of folks all of whom suffered significant losses in their political career. The second observation I would make is that the trend that we're dealing with today is one your previous panel touched on and we all understand. Politics today is this struggle between good and evil. 
And you frame your opposition as evil. You frame your opposition as morally corrupt. So to lose now is to lose to corrupt forces. And that's what feeds this notion that, well, I can't concede defeat uh, in a close race because I am conceding the success of the corrupt forces on the other side. Um, and it also creates sort of winners dancing in the end zone phenomenon because now winning means I've beaten the forces of evil on the other side, so I need not be magnanimous. I need not be on faking it for a day or so, be terribly gracious or graceful. That double set of forces in our society that affect sports, by the way, that affect entertainment, that affect business, affects how we think about winning and losing in politics. I think that's right. And I, and I appreciate that you come from Alabama a state that has a team that is known for winning uh, and a state that has a team that is living in that shadow. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know where you fall on that divide, but uh, it, it, you know, I, you are right. I think it permeates a, 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 across our culture in more than just politics. Uh, and it can be a, a, you know, a dangerous mindset as it helps to enable bad activity uh, in the name of a good cause. Uh, you know, I, we, I apologize that we don't have too much time as we have quite a few panelists. Uh, so I, I will we'll come back, I think, to, to a point that you were making, but I want to give Meredith a chance to chip in here. Meredith, as I understand, you've served as a campaign staffer. You, you specialize in communications and talking to average people uh, and, and talking to them about politics or, or speaking through uh, an, another official as a speechwriter. I'm wondering if you can share for, for us what it's like um, Convincing voters to remain engaged, uh, you know, particularly if you're if you're kind of picking up after a, in a moment where they might have just gone through an electoral defeat, um, and what it's you know separate now from from Arthur's experience as the candidate, if you can look to it as as someone maybe who understands um, the communications toward voters. Sure, and you know, there there are no winners without losers, but uh, there are also w winners because many were at one time losers. Um, and what that's true, whether you've engaged as a, a candidate or elected official, a staff person, or as a volunteer. And you think about how many elected officials have lost a race at some point in their political career and what they learned from that experience. Uh, and whether you're, again, whether you're a candidate, a staff person, a volunteer, you only need to know the feeling of losing a campaign once to know you never want to do it again. Um, but there's this learning process that happens in a unique way when you lose. And because of that, um, if you engage in a campaign again, you've done the work to kind of understand what you need to do differently. Whereas if you, you have this attitude of, well, I didn't actually lose, I won and it was stolen, you aren't taking that hard look at the things that you could have done differently and done better. Um, and, you know, I, I will say, having worked on a, a losing campaign myself, there is, is nothing more motivating um, than having gone through that experience. And um, that's something that you take with you when you talk to voters and when you talk to uh, volunteers and inspire them to um, pick up and, and work on the next campaign. Thanks. And, and I'm, I'm curious as well, then, based on that experience, uh, do you, do, is it your sense, are voters um, as willing to, to jump back into the fray in our current moment, maybe as it might have been in past experiences? Is there a difference? Are we, are we seeing a trend or uh, any thoughts along those lines? I think time will tell. Uh, I, I noticed a lot of folks coming out during the Stop the Steal movement um, that had never once volunteered on a campaign. Um, so hopefully, the outcome, disappointing as it may have been for them, uh, might motivate them to get engaged before the election happens rather than after the election happens when it's too late. Right, I think that's a great point. And uh, I guess you're right, time will tell. Uh, it's all, but that, that does seem to be like the uh, political consultant or lawyer answer to, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but I'll give you the pass because I think you're right. Um, <laughs> So next, I'd like to turn to John, um, or sorry, John, why don't I call you John? Jason, um, if you can talk uh, for a minute, I know in your academic career, you, you've studied elections in Congress uh, and that, you know, the relationship between the two uh, and how uh, ballot structures and the rest might impact uh, the way elected officials act. Uh, 
I am curious um, for your thoughts, and, and I appreciate we've got about a five minute window to answer the question, um, and this is a big one. Do you think it's possible under our current electoral system that we can ensure consistent consent from electoral losers, or do we need to make changes? Well, I think we can, I mean, and we have. I, I do think there are some changes we could make. Uh, you know, from your report, I think the, the, the point you made that, that probably will would have the most, most impact would be to move to a system where the person administering the election is not on the ballot. I mean, that you talk about the Georgia gubernatorial race and you know, I wasn't on the ground there. I can't tell you exactly what happened, but it's, it's a clear conflict of interest to have a candidate for an office administering the election. That, that's, you know, the person could have the purest of intentions, but that's just going to look bad no matter what we do. So we, we could and, and should probably do more nonpartisan uh, election administration. Uh, I think we also need to develop better candidate norms. I think, uh, you know, Senator Romney probably said this best in the debate uh, after the January 6th attack when he said, many people say, what do we tell our voters? He said, we well, tell them the truth that they lost and, and it's time to move on. And, you know, you referenced the, the Al Gore concession speech. I, I once called up all the, you know, last 40 or 50 years of concession speeches to show to my students when uh, this was in 2016, when before the election, then candidate Trump was saying, you know, the election is rigged and, you know, I just laid that out for the students to show them what a norm that had been throughout history, Democrats, Republicans, landslide elections, close elections, where you had a, a gracious accepting of defeat. So, you know, we've we've had that before, and we've had that in the context of a system where elected officials set the electoral rules, and they've always done this in a way to try to advantage them. But but we also tempered that with this norm of, of you accept the outcome as it is, and then you, then you move on. I'm curious then, uh, to follow up briefly on that point, if candidates historically, we had this norm to, to concede, uh, presumably they, they, you know, whether the norm was just a, it's what we do, so it's what we do, or they viewed that there was an incentive to concede that, you know, the public would, would heap shame upon them if they didn't. Uh, that it, it seems in my opinion, if that's the case, that something changed. Do you have any sense of, of what kind of changed as far as the public's willingness to accept uh, a lack of concession? I think it gets at what we've, we've talked about earlier with this, you know, in, in political science, what we now call effective partisanship, that it's not so much that that you care so much about your own side, it's that you think the other side is evil, and there's something, you know, inherently immoral and corrupt about the other side, and so it becomes easier to to delegitimize and, and dehumanize, if you will, the other side, and so it makes that kind of behavior acceptable because you've you've lost it to an illegitimate actor, and so then if if, if you can view them as, as not a legitimate actor, then then you yourself don't feel as constrained by the norms of, of democracy and, and democratic competition. Yeah, I think that's uh, it's unfortunate. And, and again, it kind of gets back to the, how do we, how do we help cure politics without kind of getting toward the human element that's behind all of it, right? And the way that we think about uh, us versus them, who comprises us, who comprises them and, and, and what separates us. Sarah, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Uh, I know that your work at Secure Democracy is, is focused on reforming electoral systems to improve access to elections, but also making sure that the results are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious if we can keep this conversation going about um, suggestions for particular reforms that can help ensure losers are willing to, to uh, consent to the authority of winners following elections. And I, again, it was a big question. And, and while you take a moment to think about how to answer, I will note for the folks who are joining us that our paper uh, available over at rstreet.org uh, on this topic offers four possible options. Uh, we've got you know, different uh, electoral reforms like proportional voting or ranked choice voting uh, to give uh, voters a different and perhaps more impactful say in who, um, who wins or, or in order to just maybe reduce the number of people who might identify as losers. Uh, we also look at, at ensuring nonpartisan election administration, um, combating and myths about elections, uh, as well as demanding more virtuous behavior from candidates. And, and I, I will, while you uh, continue to hold you on pause, Sarah, I will note that, Arthur, I'd like to get back to you as well about how voters can um, uh, demand virtuous behavior from their candidates as someone who has served as a, as a candidate and as a congressman. So I guess get ready for that question once, once Sarah answers. But Sarah, I'm wondering for your thoughts on, on what can we do, do as a particular reform to help uh, ensure losers' consent? Well, honestly, I think my first response is, is that one of the things I'm most concerned about is actually what's happening now. So it's not necessarily a proactive policy, but what I see is happening is that we have to actually stop what's happening in the state legislatures. 
currently, because what to me, losers consent is further being jeopardized in the upcoming elections as a result of all the policies passed in state legislatures and the bills that are being introduced already for the 2022 legislative session. These policies that have been ranging from criminalizations of elections administration, administrators, which is only going to make them less likely to want to take those sort of roles. They range to civil penalties and civil rights of action with no burden of proof. Um, and then, of course, perhaps in what most concerns me and keeps me up at night are the egregious and never ending elections investigations that are spreading like wildfire. I'm sure many people have heard about the bill introduced in Texas, which fortunately has not passed, but I think it shows where we're headed and why these state legislative actions need to be stopped in their tracks if we're ever going to get to a point where we can look at the kind of electoral reforms that our street has suggested. But the Texas bill actually would have allowed losing candidates or political party officials to initiate a review of, of not just the past election, but future elections, even just simply for losing and with no evidence of malfeasance or any burden of proof. And this is particularly concerning, not only because of the distrust that breeds amongst voters, but also because it would have applied to primary can primaries in in addition to generals. So you can imagine a scenario in which on our most extreme elements on both sides and both parties would be challenging primary votes. And in the meantime, while those votes could be being recounted, we're going into a general election, creating a potential system of chaos. Um, but you know, I think we all know this isn't just happening in Texas. Um, it's happening in swing states and it's happening in states like Michigan, Wisconsin, but also states like Nebraska, Montana, and Utah. And this is despite the fact of clear electoral victories in those states. And these are things that are further developing um, further distrust and promulgating the conspiracy theories and disinformation while reifying positions um, and beliefs that are being used to weaponize and these policies are actually creating a hostile environment to what I would say are the much needed electoral reforms. Um, the other thing I would just add is that I think Professor Donovan rightly noted that people receive signals from elected officials. So if we're going to restore trust in democratic norms, it's critical that we not only consider legislative efforts that lay the foundation for increases in failures of losers to consent. We, we have to stop these now if we're going to be able to create those cross-partisan collaborations and coalitions needed for the electoral reform. Um, and I think there's two just brief points I'll make is one, I also worry that, um, and I guess this is still the unknown, but I do think this will, will change who wants to participate and what their motivations are for participating. And then the last thing is, I think we would all do better on electoral forms if we did not only and exclusively focus on those battleground states and that we would perhaps focus on states like Alabama, Mississippi, that don't always receive as much attention. Thanks. And, and actually, I think it's there's something um, uh, poetic, maybe that's not the right word, but something I really appreciate about the idea that uh, perhaps one of the better ways to restore trust in elections and ensure losers consent is to do nothing for a bit, as far as reforms are concerned, to just kind of let things simmer um, and, and to let the heat kind of uh, be turned down a little bit. Uh, Archer, I mentioned I wanted to come back to you around um, candidate behavior. Um, we have received a question in our in our question and answer box um, regarding what everyday folks can do to have an impact on improving and reforming our democracy. It's it's my take that you know even if you can't actually change election laws, individual voters do, you know, as part of a collective, have an impact on uh, the character of the candidates that they empower. And I'm curious, as a as a former candidate yourself, uh, what your thoughts are on the ability of of candidates to um, uh, to be held to account for their character, uh, to signal to their voters what, what kind of character factors are important, uh, and if you could speak to that issue for me. Sure, uh, I'll do that, but one quick point following up on Sarah's observation. We have got to professionalize the administration of elections. In too many communities around this country, the people who count the ballots, the people who run the election day process, the people who process the absentees and the provisionals, are hardcore partisans. Uh, 
They are not neutrals in any way, shape, or form. And the same way when the World Series starts tonight in Houston, we're not going to allow Atlanta to designate half the empires and Houston to designate half the empires. Um, we need a notion of neutral people who are not political operatives or political hacks, frankly, running elections community by community. As far as voter capacity to make a change, here's what's at the root of that. Today, if you decline to recognize the legitimacy of the other side, you're rewarded for that by your political base. Your political base will say, this is a person of courage, this is a person of principle. We are going to have to change the nature of what people value in politics. One of your last panelists made the point that somewhere in the last 25 years, we've gone from a world where highly capable people who were able to think imaginably and creatively about issues were veered as the stars in their party to a world where to be a star now means you need to have a loud voice and know how to project that loud voice. That's really the main credential of being an up and coming politician now. Do you have the capacity to project yourself? Well, we've got to change the incentive structure by moving to a world where A, competence matters, where experience matters, where a demonstrated track record matters. We're having too many people run for office whose primary qualification is they pretend to care deeply about issues they know nothing about. We've got to move back to a world where people are venerated based on whether or not they show they can do a job. Unfortunately, the world of winning high office is the one high quality selection process we have for top positions in America where resumes don't matter and credentials don't matter. If you begin to change that underlying foundation, all of the issues we've talked about today will eventually change. Great, thank you. Yeah, and, and I'd like to kind of keep our, our around the horn feel going and move to Meredith again uh, and give you a chance to respond to, to what you might've heard from your fellow panelists. Uh, and in particular, um, you know, some thoughts that you might have around uh, some of our best opportunities to, to ensure greater consent from losing uh, voters. Yeah, and one thing that Sarah pointed out earlier, rightly, was that something's gotta give. And Todd made a great comment in the first session when he said that campaigns have to operate appropriately. And his question of how do you instill that virtue in candidates to be able to win or lose graciously. And there's a responsibility that in some ways lies with the staff and consultants as well to prepare a candidate for uh, the potential of both outcomes. Uh, certainly there's a balance there operationally, you wanna keep your focus uh, as a campaign operative on doing what it takes uh, to win for as long as possible. But if you've done everything right operationally, election day is believe it or not a pretty slow day in the campaign office. So uh, the night before, the day of, both of those are great opportunities to have that at times challenging conversation and say, listen, you know, things look optimistic, but let's stay humble. Let's be prepared with two speeches just in case things don't break our way. And let's also be prepared to win or to concede graciously. Um, unfortunately, I think some of the people in the president's circle were afraid to approach the president with that reality. And, and that's ultimately, in, in my opinion, partly attributable to, uh, to the horror that we saw on, uh, on January 6th. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess you're, it does tickle me as someone who has dabbled a bit in, in helping with campaigns, how, how slow election day can be. Uh, and yet from the outside, it doesn't always, uh, most folks would not see it that way. Um, Jason, I want to I come back to you. I know that, that you've now had a chance to listen to kind of all the rest of the panelists, and I want to give you a little bit of an open floor uh, to provide some response to that. But I'd also like to raise a question that was brought up in the Q&A. Um, related to what Americans can learn uh, uh, from other countries, perhaps that uh, you know, the United States. I brought up this this poll in the first half of our discussion today uh, that Americans are are not satisfied with the state of democracy. Um, this was a poll from last week from Pew Research, uh, and that they see that there's a real opportunity for reform. But on the other side of it, we have countries around the world that do have uh, broad support for their democracy in their country, 
uh, and that you know at the moment are satisfied with the way things are going. Uh, the Q&A brought up Switzerland as an example where folks feel that they can trust their government. I think this Pew poll uh, brought up you know the Netherlands and, and Sweden uh, and, and New Zealand and a few other countries. And I'm curious from your perspective, um, both you know to reflect on what we've heard and also if you do have some thoughts to share about what we might be able to learn from other countries. Yeah, to, to reflect on what we heard, I think I'd like to tie together two points that, that Meredith and, and Arter made about uh, election administration and getting people involved. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it takes thousands and thousands of individuals across the country to administer elections, to work on election day, to do those kinds of things. You know, I'm on the local elections board here in my county, and, you know, it's like we run 45 pop-up businesses a couple of days a year. It's, it's a really massive undertaking. And you know, most of the people who are doing that are, are very, very professional, very hardworking. And I think if you could get people who care about parties to get involved in this, uh, they might see this process a little more. I recall last, last November when, when we were sitting in the elections board late at night counting absentee ballots, one of my Republican colleagues looked over at me after we just spent an hour and a half trying to chase down a, a missing ballot. And she looked at me and she said, you know, it would be really, really hard to commit voter fraud given the processes we have in place. And I said, you know, that's true. We need to make sure we share that with people and, and have people see that. And, and, and this is Meredith's point. If people would get engaged before the election and, and, and see how these processes work, I think you'd feel much better about it. And you'd have a, a fewer people questioning the outcome if they would look at the controls and the, and the, the quality checks that, that go into administering an election. I'm not really an expert on comparative politics. I don't want to speak out of school about what other countries that we could learn from, but uh, I do think if we if we paid more attention on the front end and, and didn't see this so much as a horse race, we would we would have a better, more confidence in our outcomes we're getting on the back end. Great, thanks. So Sarah, I will come back to you. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left here, and I uh, since you were the last to go in the first in the first group, um, you may have you know heard some reactions to your reactions, and I want to grant you the opportunity to provide a reaction to those reactions to your reactions. Uh, and so with that in mind, you know, any, any closing thoughts that you might have, and I'll, I'll go very briefly around the horn uh, after this, if folks want to uh, share, you know, about a minute of a closing thought. Sure. I'll, I'll say two things very quickly. One is um, I do agree with Professor Roberts. I actually think helping educate the public about the processes that are already in place is something that we can do to build that trust. But I also want to leave on a positive proactive note. While some of the large scale electoral reforms might take longer and require coalition building, there are things we can do in state legislatures that should not be partisan. Things as simple as adding ballot tracking to all absentee ballots so that voters can actually see the process, elections administrators can track them, and then, then people can see if something has gone wrong or the ballot isn't received. I also think, you know, every state should have some form of risk limiting audit. And I also think we should make those those things transparent. So they're posted on the Secretary of State's website. So I think there are small steps we can take to start rebuilding that trust in the interim. Great. Thank you. Archer, closing thought? With respect to the comparative politics issue, one thing that always strikes me about other countries in the election process, the candidates don't become cults of personality unless they win. In many European countries, for example, the closest norm perhaps to our politics, or even in Israeli politics and Canadian politics, the reality is that the party and the set of ideas and policies associated with the various parties on the ballot dominate the election process, the personalities less so. This is a country where because of the extended nature of our primary systems, the personalities of the candidates and the qualities of the candidate go on center stage much earlier than other countries. I think that has an interesting impact on our politics in ways beyond this discussion today. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had not thought of it that way before, and especially with regard to the way that the primaries play this role of uh, taking folks who might agree on 99% of policies and instead hyping their, their personality differences. Um, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Meredith, a final thought from you? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, losing is, it's just really difficult because it's emotional. Uh, it's a reflection of a failure that's taken place and, and often a very personal one. Operationally, campaigns are, are more than a full-time job for many. And when you commit uh, the time, the resources, the money that you need in order to be competitive, a lot of times you wind up engaging your family, your friends, your loved ones in the campaign. And so there's a lot of personal exposure wrapped up in winning and losing. And 
Um, I also believe it, and I hope that that most, not all, but most uh, political candidates really understand the weight and the responsibility that they'll have to take on uh, to, to help their constituents once they reach elected office. And, and with that comes the idea that uh, Archer pointed out, which is, is you kind of develop this notion of, uh, this very polarized notion of good versus evil, and that certainly plays a role in what makes losing so devastating and, and also alternatively what makes winning so joyful. But looking at the necessity of the, the pal palatability of concession when it's necessary, making sure that candidates are educated about the realities of winning or losing. And to Professor Roberts' great point of educating volunteers and people that engage in the uh, elections process, who are oftentimes, they're just local volunteers. Um, and, and really engaging them in the process is, is where we're gonna start to see positive changes. Thanks, and I appreciate ending on a note of optimism. And I've pointed out a few times that this subject can be uh, a little pessimistic because our politics is just not a forum for happiness and joy at the moment. Um, but it is nice to remember that there are good folks out there working on this uh, and that there are positive ideas for ways in which uh, our country can come together. And even if we disagree on policy, we can agree on democracy. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and thank our, our viewers for joining in and tuning in. Uh, a recording will be made available for those who are interested later, and you can find out more about Losers Consent and the work that we are doing over at R Street Institute at our website, rstreet.org. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us.